My guest today is Spencer Kimball, the founder and CEO of Cockroach Labs, the creators of Cockroach DB, cloud native distributed SQL database. I asked Spencer to come over to talk about the role of a CEO coach and what value this person can bring to the table. Spencer, it's great to have you. Thank you, Artem. It's a pleasure to be here. So how about we set the stage uh, with a quick overview of the Cockroach Labs before we go into the actual discussing the CEO coach questions? Sure. So it's uh, been a long journey. This is now the eighth year. Maybe I'm getting close to eight and a half years now. It's, uh, you know, it started off as really an idea to build some infrastructure as open source that had been under development at Google. I was at Google for about 10 years along with my co-founders from 22, or sorry, 2002, <laughs> all the way to 2012. So better part of a decade. And uh, at Google, there were a lot of interesting distributed systems being built. I worked on one called Colossus. At around the same time, they started uh, at the most recent generation of their distributed database technology, which is known as Spanner. So in 2012, Spanner was just making it into production as we were deciding that we wanted to do a startup. And in that startup, we actually realized that in order to really build for the future we wanted to see, we needed something like Spanner. And it wasn't available, right? This was something behind the, the sort of um, Google uh, you know, ecosystem that wasn't really available on GCP yet. Uh, it is now today, but it took them quite some time to actually make that available in their um, public cloud product. So we decided that we you know, uh, needed a database like this. We looked at all of the available systems, which at that point included things like HBase and Cassandra and MongoDB, and of course the Postgres and MySQL, uh, some of the things that were already in the cloud and nothing really checked all the boxes that Spanner had. So that's where the idea of Cockroach really came uh, to take some shape. And I almost started building it in pursuit of that startup just as a necessary piece of infrastructure. But around that exact time, Amazon came out with DynamoDB, which I realized would at least have the scaling properties we wanted and um, you know, not require us to build our own database, which obviously is a pretty large undertaking. As we ended up using DynamoDB, but we had a lot of problems with it because it wasn't transactional, didn't have its own concept of indexes. and A lot of things that we needed to do, we had to build on top of DynamoDB and didn't quite have the right primitives to make that work well. So when we finished that company and um, started working at Square, I think it sort of acquired all of our engineering talent. Uh, we also realized that Square had a bunch of problems with databases, problems that would be um, really solvable if they had a system like Google Spanner. So that's where the idea of Cockroach came back again, it came back with a vengeance, because now we'd seen, okay, Google had, had this need through the entire decade we were there. And obviously, uh, Spanner was now being heavily used within Google. Uh, we needed it in a small startup, just in terms of what we wanted to build ambitiously for the future. And Square had a bunch of products at that point, more than 70, I think, that um, were struggling with databases and really could use those same capabilities. So that was the start of Cockroach. Think of it as a distributed relational database system. So this is distinct from something like an analytics system. Uh, this is where you put your operational data, the metadata for all your customers and your orders and your uh, inventory, just the metadata of the day-to-day -day operations of uh, any business. So, these, uh, so it's a very critical foundational uh, capability. Oracle is really the, the big incumbent in the industry. Um, Amazon AWS with their various relational products, mostly built on open source, I think is now the largest, but uh, you know, they, they, have, they have a lot more customers that are smaller. Oracle has a lot fewer customers that are really big and, and quite, a, quite a few actually in absolute numbers. Uh, so we're, what we, where we are sit in that uh, whole uh, solution space is really pushing the idea that you can exploit cloud hardware to build extremely reliable and large databases, which are uh, things that Google needed in the aughts. But now almost everyone needs if you have ambitions to build uh, an application that's going to be you know, uh, world changing, which I think most, most folks are setting out to do, especially now with the AI boom seemingly entering full swing. Right. And it was quite a journey indeed. 
you're backed by pretty much every important or top tier venture capital firm and uh you're valued at about five billion dollars which is a like incredible achievement uh for you as a founders and the whole team of Cochris Labs. So I know that you worked with some type of groups that help you as a CEO to build your company. You call it CEO Pod before starting with a CEO coach about a year ago. So talk about these two experiences. What was the value of the pod that you did for about three years, I believe, and then uh, the last year with the CEO coach and how those two experiences compare? Yeah, I mean, I'd say that they both have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I didn't weigh those strengths and weaknesses before starting with the pod. Uh, I didn't, uh, you know, in both cases, I wouldn't say I just sort of fell into them, but it seemed appropriate at the time what was on offer. You know, you, you always kind of uh, have things put in front of you, whether it's somebody that suggests on your board, oh, you know, you really should look into a CEO coach. And that, that actually can provide a lot of impetus to, to go and make that a reality, especially if they say, talk to this person. I've had great luck with them. Uh, so that's a, that's a, that's a pretty powerful um, reference, right? That, that can lead you to action. Uh, uh, or you just get the right, you get introduced to the right person and they pitch you on something. Uh, and it just seems appropriate and right at the time. Uh, the, I think the interesting thing about the CEO pod uh, that was very appealing at the time was that I, I actually was interested in hearing from other companies that were a little bit further along than we were in, in terms of some of their challenges and things that I was going to have to uh, come to grips with at Cockroach Labs. When I started that CEO pod, we really didn't have much of a go-to-market yet. Um, you know, we, we'd spent a lot of time building our product, just getting the minimal viable product. And uh, really almost three years before we actually you know, seriously went to market, we had all kinds of prospective customers that were interested in what we were building and offering to be design partners, but nobody was really paying us yet. So when I joined the CEO pod, which is actually something called Venwise, uh, V-E-N-W-I-S-E, there were a lot of folks that were kind of B2C stage. And almost everyone had, had already been struggling building go-to-market. And they were using all this terminology in terms of enterprise selling that I'd never heard of before, but I, <laughs> it became pretty clear quickly to me that I needed to learn this stuff. Uh, and I felt like a, a, you know, a babe in the woods, I guess. Uh, very underexperienced in, in this. And actually listening to all these things uh, really inspired me and actually gave me, uh, I guess, my first real uh, context to understand what the challenges would look like and what we needed to build at Cockroach. And that continued. And the interesting thing about these pods is as you progress, the pod composition changes. You know, in this case, I think it was around five to seven CEOs uh, and the companies were typically, at least in my pod, uh, so doing B two B kinds of selling, um, all, all different verticals. I mean, it was I was the only infrastructure company in there, um, but you know, sometimes shared customers and, and definitely shared challenges. Uh, it was almost like a a big group therapy session <laughs> in some ways, and I actually think that's a great strength. And by the way, that's a there's kind of a one-on-one -on -one therapy session happening with a, a CEO coach, which is a lot more just about your, your problems. The interesting thing about the pod is you get a chance to you know, pattern match with all these other CEOs. And everyone comes with their biggest prob problem, also their sort of status update. And it actually becomes a pretty interesting drama, like a, you know, a soap opera serial where every month or whatever it is that I think that was the periodicity we met at, you'd actually get the new drama that was unfolding. You know, this this person is trying to sell their company, you know, this suitor that was going to be the white knight coming in and buying them and like seems to have evaporated, but there's this other interesting thing. And, and boy, some of these stories were kind of harrowing at times. And so it was, it was always interesting to follow along in the progress of these, these other companies and, and to sympathize and, and ultimately to offer advice. And then you'd follow up with your status update and your problems and, 
And the reality with all these things is you kind of get out what you put into them. And so being very honest about your issues means that you're actually going to have, you know, for what it's worth, sometimes better, sometimes not so good, you're going to get advice. And um, if you're not talking about your real problems, then even if people are giving you good advice, it's not really addressing your, your critical path obstacle. Right? So uh, you know, I think there's a temptation. It certainly has been true for me, and I, I see it for, with, with other founders and CEOs, at least on occasion. There's a temptation to, to make everything look better than it is. Because <laughs> you know, that's, that's definitely part of your job, right? You're selling the vision. So it's not really how things are, it's how you expect them to be. And if, if you can't do that, you're not doing your job as CEO. But there's a time um, where that's not appropriate. Most of the time it is. But when you're in one of these coaching sessions, whether it's a group or it's an individual one-on-one, -on -one, this is the time to be brutally honest. Not like self-flagellating, right? Like that's never helpful. But like, you know, you, you, gotta, you gotta be good at verbalizing this sort of state of things. Because if you don't do that, then it's hard to fix the problem. And it's not just in the therapy session or, you know, the pod or the coaching, whatever. It's actually in how you talk to your executive team right? and, and ultimately how you talk to the company. Right? You have to verbalize the problem. You have to make it understandable, uh, you know, coach it in or couch it in kind of a, the, the larger trajectory. You know, here's what's gone wrong. And here's what's going wrong. Here's how, uh, you know, here are the different factors that are contributing to that. Can you describe all that? Because that can help everyone who's listening to you source solutions. Right, which is critically important, I think, with your executive team, but also important with your company. People appreciate that kind of transparency and you want that decentralized contribution to trying to fix the problem. And, uh, you know, when you're talking to a bunch of other CEOs, especially in the times when I was in a pod where the other CEOs were a, a little bit more advanced than me, to say the least, I got some great feedback. So it was, that was very useful. Now, there can come a time, and this is kind of where I get to some of the drawbacks, where your pod hasn't grown as quickly as you have. Or some of the people that were really good contributors um, graduated or weren't participating more, they sold their company, something like that. And so all of a sudden, you're the one, you, you, you're giving more good advice than you're getting, right? which is also very useful. I mean, it's, it's part of, I think, being a, a good CEO founder is to support the ecosystem. And that's one really interesting way to do it. You're actually having a chance to become a coach. Uh, so you, you you start off junior in the group and then maybe you become senior in the group. And that's something that you, it's a responsibility that you should embrace at least for some period of time. Um, but eventually you may need to move on, you know, find a pod where the, the stages become more appropriate, where again, maybe you're the junior member of the group um, and you just have to kind of know when to pull the plug. And uh, another interesting thing about the pod is there is a coach. There's somebody that's helping to to orchestrate the interaction, the dynamic, um, keep people kind of on track, you know, <laughs> uh, and and uh, make sure everyone's heard and so forth. And uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a critical part of it. So it's the the constitution of the group and and the person that's leading it. And so you, you may not find the right one when you start, but I think there's an opportunity to change things up so that they they are actually adding value as you go. And again, I think that process, for me at least, can sometimes be difficult. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, I never want to tell people like, ooh, this isn't working for me anymore. You know what I mean? It's a um, slightly uncomfortable. Uh, I, I like when everything is, is, going, is going well, and I don't necessarily want to tell people that I don't find the, the, the larger program useful when they're part of it. Um, but, you know, that sort of honesty, again, this is, this is the, the critical a critical element to get right when you're participating in these kinds of uh, forums. And like, if, if you can't be honest with yourself and the people in the room, it's, it's not worthwhile. It's not worth your time. That's where you're really wasting it. So you, you asked for a little bit of a contrast for the one-on-one -on -one coaching. And, and I suspect some of it's already apparent from my description of the pod, which is obviously very colorful and it's not all about you. Um, the, the, the coaching, which is one-on-one, -on -one, is all about you. I mean, it's just fun. I mean, I, I ask the coach how they're doing and I, I'm interested in their life and it's nice to build that human connection. I think it makes the, 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 
the, the work more productive. But what this is, is it's ultimately an opportunity for you to get your thinking straight. And I think the, the, the right coach is somebody that's going to be like the therapist that lets you talk long enough that you understand the key to unlock your own problems. I mean, if they're really good, they're, they're going to provide just the right additional questions and maybe even suggestions in cases that uh, kind of get you over uh, you know, some sort of obstacle that you don't even see in front of your face. And that's almost always what they are. You, I mean, you're so in the weeds, you're so you know, sort of emotionally identified with looking for success that sometimes you can become blind to like um, a problem that if you just look from a slightly different perspective, you see that you're uh, really unnecessarily impeded, maybe by something of your own construction. Like uh, I'll just give you one example. These human relationships that are critical to success, uh, when things change in some fashion, your business hits a new inflection point, there's different complexity, or you may have pivoted or something like that. Somebody that you, you deeply care about, who's been instrumental to your success to that point in time, uh, isn't the right person for the job anymore. Sometimes that can be a very difficult thing to see because it's, a, it, it's such a discontinuity, the realization of it. Uh, that's, a, that's an area where someone that helps you talk through things. I mean, the, the proximate sort of surface problem that you might be discussing is that you, you, you're failing at uh, achieving the, the sales targets that you set. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons that could be true. Having somebody really um, probe you on it to actually not understand what you're talking about until it's so clear that you're actually having new understanding. Right? It's like, you don't really know the material until you can teach it, is what some people say. Uh, so, you know, it, I think a good coach kind of plays uh, ignorant, even when they're not, right? Because they want you to figure the, the things out yourself by uh, really uh, having to get extremely introspective and um, go deep with the explanations. Like, that doesn't quite make sense. Can you try to explain that again? Or like, I don't, there's just this thing that, you know, all of that makes sense, but this other little thing somehow doesn't tie together. Like, what am I missing? That sort of interrogation, that's, that can be perfection when it's done well. Um, because when you do have those aha moments, the, the, the time between that and your next coaching session can be very productive. That's uh, a lot to unpack, but, in the interest of time and before we go into this, how about we first talk about how did you find the coach for you that you've been working with for the last year? And are there any specific things to think about when looking for the right partner there? Because many of the founders I know struggle with finding the right coach. They interview many people. They have like a session or two, but nothing really clicks. So did you have the click moment uh, the first time you talked to a person or did it take some time to unfold? How did it go for you? That's a good question. So I, I met them because our chief people officer had actually already been working with this person uh, and they'd, they'd been working with our CRO and our CMO. So we actually had quite a bit of experience with them. Both spoke very highly of this coach. Uh, it's, it's an organization called Trium. And, you know, honestly, after my pot experience, I've done it for three years. I was, um, you know, not really feeling like that group setting was so useful for me. And I wasn't so sure about the one-on-one. -on -one. I, I kind of have my doubts, to be honest. Uh, just felt like, you know, I'd be lying down on the couch being psychoanalyzed. <laughs> That's kind of what was in my head. And frankly, there's some truth to that. Uh, but I wasn't quite sure that that would translate into real utility. And it's always feels like an imposition when you realize that, ooh, that, that hour's coming up or whatever it is, you know, where I'm going to have to unburden my soul. <laughs> and it's like, ooh, is that, am I ready for that? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit much. And I think 
um, one of the things that can make it click or not click is if the the, the person on the other end of that is is sensitive. That you kind of need to ease into it sometimes, get the get the honesty flowing and the you know feel the the right degree of comfort where you can even be honest with yourself, which isn't always that easy to do. I think that's actually the key challenge. Um, so you know what makes that click? I think if if a CEO hasn't had any luck and they've talked to three. I mean, three is usually the, the the magic number in my experience. Um, I didn't end up talking to three in this case because, you know, this person already been. I was the third person they worked with, <laughs> so we actually had some good data points there. So I was it was on the strength of a strong, you know, internal reference. But if you don't find the relationship clicking after you talk to three, I think you have to look hard at how you're approaching it. Because I think. After talking to three professional coaches, I mean, you might have you might have just gotten three strikes, and you know they they weren't good pitches or whatever. I'm, I'm killing that metaphor, sorry. Uh, but the, I think, more likely you're just not engaging in a way that's useful to you. And again, I go back to that point about honesty. Right? You have to you have to suspend that normal inclination that you've built up over years of of painting the picture of your inevitable success <laughs> critical critical 90 something percent of the time that's got to be where your mind's at and have that that will to power you know uh, but in this environment it's not you know we're inevitably going to succeed it's like what what if, if i'm really honest what do, what are we what are we screwing up right now what is not looking good? What what seems to be like a, you know, if there was one thing I could just clap my hands and it would be solved, what would that be? And then let's try to like dig deep into that and then make that the whole topic. Like what's bugging me the most? What's really causing me to lose sleep? Let's get honest about it and try to like uh, disentangle all the potential causes. Do you think when you look back at your journey from the very first start of your first company, out of Google up to this point, was there any period of time when you would say the CEO coach would not be helpful for you? If say you would you would not you would hire someone at that particular stage and that would be a waste of your time. That's a great question. And I would definitely point to the the early stages where you're you know really just building a product, trying to iterate quickly and fail fast get to an MVP that has some degree of product market fit. I mean, a coach there, unless things are falling apart, I, I don't think that would be super useful. You don't need to be incredibly introspective there. You need to just be, you know, cranking. I think the problems, you, you don't need a coach to solve those problems. I mean, you, you might very well benefit from an advisor or a, a group of advisors like angels or other entrepreneurs that have done similar things. You know, someone that has a super data-driven approach to measuring like consumer cohorts or whatever, that's a great person to talk to, right? They can help you blow through some obstacles you might have. Uh, but I think the problems are less complex. They're more tactical and they're less personal, like people-based. And uh, I'm not saying it wouldn't be useful then. I just think that uh, the imposition of having to to get super honest about things is less useful and less necessary at that stage. I see. And in terms of, you mentioned advisors, and your approach and your experience with working both with the CEO coach and with advisors, how do they differ? How do they contrast? How do you use these two relationships? Well, I mean, a coach is, you're paying them to to be the the sounding board, to be the the, the interlocutor, the maybe even the interrogator, right? In some cases, uh, and it's all your time, and you're the you're the fundamental point of the session. Now that might be true with a, a good investor that's on your board. Say your first investor, I have some really great ones, but. And then I, I, it, I've never had them spend an hour like going deeper and deeper, um, trying to tease out 
the things. Uh, they're much they're much better sort of pattern matching. Say, go look at this company. I can connect you with this advisor, and it's like you know, hopefully for them, it's a thirty minute call, right? And uh, it, it just it, it's a very different qualitative experience. And I think that it both are very useful. If I look over the whole history of doing cockroach labs, I've I've gotten uh, you know in total a lot more out of the interactions with my board directors because that's just been longer, right? It's been a, a constant thing for eight years. Um, but just in the last year where I've had this uh, CEO coach, I feel like uh, this is a whole new kind of interaction. It's just different from anything I've done previously. And it's very useful. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you could get what I'm getting from this coach from a, a board director, at least that would be a that would be a, an interesting thing for me to imagine. That's not how my board directors are. Uh, they're they're great in many ways, but uh, you know, I, that's not what they're equipped to do. Right. And by the way, speaking about the the need to be completely open and honest, I saw a lot of entrepreneurs being hesitant of being completely open and honest with their investors. So there may be something to that as well. You also mentioned that it's not only important in your communications with the CEO pod or with coach, but also with your exec team and with ultimately with your company. I'm curious about your experience because lots of entrepreneurs, I usually get like a reluctance on that level. And specifically because they are concerned that if they share all their thinking about the problems or the specific problem facing the company right now, it might frighten the team. It might frighten it to a degree that they will stop being functional. And that's a no good thing for the company. The team should be above all be functional. So that's their kind of thinking. If they're scared, they cannot function well. If they cannot function well, we're definitely doomed. So I might as well not make them scared. So how did you, how do you think about it now after eight years of running the company? Well, I mean, it, your, uh, your setup here is very common. And, you know, I faced that quandary many times and as has the whole executive team and trying to understand what we should, how we should respond to a challenge but it's a false choice, right? Between uh, just projecting pure confidence as the visionary founder <laughs> right? and, and, and fearless leader, uh, or we're going to level with everyone. And man, you know, people are going to see like all the warts, and it's going to be uh, difficult to keep the morale up. I mean, there's there's a. It would certainly be the case if in your next team meeting. You told everyone like, holy shit, we've got all these big problems. <laughs> like this looks existential. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do. Right? That, is, that is absolutely not what you should do. <laughs> However, there's the, 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 the problem with not saying anything and, and trying to level with, with what's wrong is that everyone does see the problem. And people are talking about them and people are worried like, well, I mean, what about this? And people don't really have the right answer. You know, what are we doing? Well, this person thinks we should do that and this person, this other one. And so, you know, to the extent the problem is very visible, well, you have to, you have to address it. But if it's a little less visible and it's just starting to, to appear, you get a lot of different perspectives and they're not all right and they're not aligned by any means. And you're, you're creating, there's this sort of rumble that builds of discontent and nervousness. So you're not really avoiding the problem. I mean, unless unless it's one that's not a real problem, it just goes away. Then, yeah, you probably didn't need to address it in the first place. However, there's always real problems. What you need to do when you're when you're telling people that you've got a problem, which I think you absolutely should, you should wait until you have a solution. <laughs> it might not be the right solution, but like, what's the plan? I mean, that's fundamentally what the executive team is supposed to be formulating, I mean, amongst other things. But that's a major major goal. Is like. We're going to quickly identify our issues, what's holding us back. And, you know, to the extent it's a difficult one, let's figure out what we're going to do. What's the best course of action? Where are we going to put our resources? What's going to change? And, and why do we think this is going to succeed? And that's what you explain. Right? People, people want to be leveled with, but they also want to have a plan of action. You can align people around that. 
And so I, I think you, you do have to bite that bullet, but don't just do it in a way that, that sows fear. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I, I understand that's the concern, but there's no, absolutely no reason. Good leadership is actually um, to, to tackle these things head on, explain them to people and, and fundamentally make the explanation include a very understandable path forward. Yeah, that's the most important thing for people in my experience as well, to have the, to see that you have an idea of the direction and that you have full trust in them being capable to get there and to figure things out. And uh, basically then they're happy to continue because they come here to do the work, to actually succeed with you. And as long as they feel that there is a way and you believe in them being able to succeed, they'll be excited to continue on this journey. Spencer, thanks a lot uh, for joining me today. Great points on coaching. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, Artem. I appreciate the opportunity to chat.